Before describing the event in more detail, I'd first like to thank everyone in the Osgood Indigenous Student Association, the Osgood Hall Law Union, and the Distinguished Speaker Series Organizing Committee, who helped create and organize this event. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the Mississauga people whose traditional land our campus is situated on. I Don't Know More is more than a protest. It is a movement addressing concerns over legislative changes, the duty to consult, the honor of the crown, and indigenous sovereignty more broadly. The I Don't Know More founders call on the opposition and rejection of legislative changes implemented by the federal government that affects Aboriginal rights without prior consultation. The major piece of legislation in question is Bill C-45, the 2012 Omnibus Budget Bill, which included amendments to the Indian Act, the Fisheries Act, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, the Navigable Waters Protection Act, uh, among others. I, the I Don't More movement not only is a response to these changes, but it raises broader issues concerning the position and status of Aboriginal people in Canada and the political, social, and legal issues at stake. In today's discussion, we will explore the legal basis for the I Don't More movement and investigate the various legal duties, obligations, and case law that should inform the relationship between Aboriginal people, the Government of Canada, and all Canadians more broadly. We aim to explore whether there is a solid foundation in the law for the movement and contend that not only are concerns raised by Island No More legitimate, but there is a firm legal ground on which to stand. Today we are very lucky to be joined by three speakers, Professor Kent McNeil, who is here at Osgood, Andre Bossell, also a professor at Osgood, and Senwon Mu, a lawyer with OKT LLP, an Aboriginal law firm here in Toronto. Our format today will consist of a brief presentation from each of our speakers on an issue or issues regarding the legal dimension of the I Don't More movement. Following this, there will be a general Q&A with the audience, which you're all welcome to participate in. First up, we have Professor Kent McNeil. Professor McNeil is one of Canada's foremost academics in the area of Aboriginal law. He's been a faculty member at Osgoode Hall Law School since 1987 and was formerly the research director of the University of Saskatchewan Native Law Center. Professor McNeil's primary research interest is in the rights of Indigenous peoples, particularly Canada, Australia, and the United States. He has written a book, Common Law Aboriginal Title, and numerous monographs and articles on the subject. Aspects of his work include land rights, treaty rights, and self-government. Please welcome Professor McNeil. here, but I just wanted to get the, the microphone here just to be a minute and get hooked up. Okay, well, I want to talk about the, uh, the legal and constitutional aspects uh, in relation to legislation in particular and the um, and whether there's a duty to consult in the context of uh, legislation passed by Parliament. And I'm just going to throw out some ideas of my thinking about this. I don't think there are any definite answers to this yet. It's an area of the law that I think is, is very uncertain and uh, is still developing. And I certainly think that the, the I Don't Know More movement has uh, legitimate reasons to be concerned about legislation such as Bill C-45 uh, that's enacted without consultation with uh, First Nations and other Aboriginal peoples in, in Canada. Uh, the, the, st the statute, and as you know, it's an omnibus bill. As Katie said, it, it includes, it's not just a budget, it includes amendments to uh, various other statutes and statutes relating to things like fishing and environmental protection and so on, all of which has close relationship with uh, Aboriginal rights and, and treaty rights. So, you know, hence the concern of the I Don't Know More movement and, and others. And as I understand it, they, they are claiming that consultation should have taken place uh, before 
the statute was enacted. And certainly that is correct politically, I, I would think. Whether it's correct legally is, I think, uh, uh, still quite an open question. I would say it's, that it's partially correct, <laughs> right? Uh, so the answer of whether it's correct or not, I think, is, is uh, part, partly yes and, and partly no. Uh, on the yes side, um, Aboriginal treaty rights are, of course, protected against infringement by the Constitution. So they're recognized and affirmed in Section 35 of the 1982 Constitution Act. And any infringement of those rights, whether by executive action or by legislative action, has to be justified. And the Supreme Court has said that part of the test for justification is consultation. So if there's an established aboriginal right in relation to land or resources or, or other matters, or if there's a, an established treaty right and legislation is going to potentially infringe that right, I think there's a, a duty to consult. Now, this doesn't mean that the legislation is invalid if no consultation takes place. What I do think it means is that if no consultation takes place and there's an infringement, the government is not going to be able to justify that infringement, so the legislation will have to be read down so that the infringement doesn't take place. Uh, I, I don't think the duty to consult can prevent Parliament from enacting laws of general application, right? But it's the impact of those laws on uh, Aboriginal peoples, I think, that gives rise to the duty to, to consult. So it, it's going to depend on the context as well, because the, the legislation itself might infringe an Aboriginal treaty right, or maybe the implementation of the legislation down the road. And there's a, a question here about when the duty to consult arises. Uh, now, the, the Supreme Court has said that you know, duty to consult arises not just at the implementation stage, but at the strategic planning stage. Okay, And that could include enacting legislation. Now, I think that is the point that isn't clear at this point. Um, what I've been talking about up to now is more about established Aboriginal and treaty rights. And, you know, cases like Sparrow and uh, the Gladstone case involving Aboriginal fishing rights or the Marshall case from Nova Scotia involving treaty rights, they involve the application of the Fisheries Act and regulations to Aboriginal fishing, right? And in each of those cases, the Supreme Court said the Fisheries Act and its regulations do not apply if they infringe those rights and the infringement has not been justified, okay? And as I said, without consultation, prior consultation, it's gonna be very hard for the government to justify these kind of infringements. But those are established rights. Those cases involve established rights. However, the Supreme Court has also said that where Aboriginal rights are claimed but not yet proven in court or not yet recognized in a modern land claim agreement or in a historic treaty, that the government still has a duty to consult if it proposes to undertake action that might have a negative impact on those rights. Okay, so in this context, uh, I think the, the duty to consult might be a little different. It's not as strong as in a situation where there's going to be an infringement, right? I think there the, the, the duty to consult is very strong. But if the right hasn't been established yet, there's a duty to consult, and it's on a scale from a, a deep duty to you know, a much lesser duty, depending on the strength of the claim on the one side and the potential impact of the government action uh, on the other side. And in that area, again, is there a duty to consult in relation to the legislation? Well, you know, the Haida case is the main case, uh, or certainly the first case that established this duty to consult for unproven rights. 
And that involved provincial legislation, the, the Forced Act in British Columbia. I, I don't think the Supreme Court said anything about having, about the government having to consult before enacting the Forced Act, which is an act of general application. But in applying the Forced Act to Haida Gwaii uh, and granting tree farm licenses there, that was when the duty to consult arose. So it seemed to be more the impl implementation of the legislation that gave rise to the duty rather than the enactment of the legislation. So as I say, there's a, a lot of uncertainty here. And so I'm, I'm just throwing these things out. I, I apologize that it's, it's quite legalistic what I'm saying, uh, but it is a matter of constitutional law. And because the duty to consult arises in the context of constitutional rights, Aboriginal treaty rights, uh, I, I think the duty to consult is a constitutional obligation. So in appropriate circumstances, it should be binding on the executive branch as well as on the legislative branch. You know, that's what constitutions are about. They control legislation as well as executive action. Um, but as I say, I think it depends very much on, on the circumstances. So that's all I want to say in terms of introduction. So, I think Senwon, are you going to go next? Sure. Yeah, did you want to introduce yep. Senwon? So, thank you very much, Professor McNeil. Um, our next speaker is Senwon Duke. He is an associate at OKT. He works on Aboriginal title litigation <coughs> and treaty claims. Uh, he received his JD from Osgoode Hall Law School, where he won awards for the highest standing in Aboriginal law, civil liberties, and constitutional law courses. He served as a law clerk to Mr. Justice John Evans of the Federal Court of Appeal. He also received a Bachelor of Civil Law from the University of Oxford, where he wrote a master's dissertation on the, constitu on the constitutional protection of Aboriginal self-government rights. Please welcome Sen Wan. which way it goes. Okay, sorry. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Um, so I, I'm an associate at uh, Oldest Clear Township LLP. We're a small firm practicing mainly on behalf of First Nations in downtown Toronto. Um, so I'd like to preface and say that um, I'm here to speak for myself, uh, not necessarily for the firm not necessarily for our clients and uh, not necessarily for Indigenous people in Canada. Um, but I'll try to tell you my own perspective um, from uh, of these events, uh, from sort of being caught in, in, uh, in between uh, all of these constituencies. Um, so thanks for putting this panel together. Uh, I am probably the least distinguished uh, of the panelists, so I I'm actually pinch hitting for uh, Lorraine Land, who is a partner at the office, and she can't, she couldn't make it today. Um, she sends her apologies. She's been dragged away on an injunction. Um, so I think that's highly uh, apropos in light of what we're going to talk about today, and I'll address that in a little bit. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor McNeil, who uh, probably more than anyone got me interested in this topic uh, that, you know, I've pursued this interest for the 10 years, five years after, five, somewhere between five and 10 years after uh, taking your class. So thank you very much. Um, so thank you for acknowledging the traditional territory of the Mississaugas. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the Huron-Wendat, uh, who used to have a village under the hydro field outside here. And their parking, the, the parking lot to Passy Gardens is actually built on top of their village and their ossuary. Uh, so I'd just like to sort of begin from, uh, begin from that fact uh, in talking about what Idle No More means to me uh, today. So how did we end up building a parking lot at university 
a student dormitory on top of other people's graves. Um, so this, was, this, this is not ancient history. Passy Gardens, uh, many of you know, was built in what, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so before that, uh, at, at, or at that time, there wasn't such a thing as the duty to consult. So municipal land use decisions were made by the municipal authorities. And, uh, and if they decided that's where the parking lot was going to go, that's where it was going to go. So why, uh, you know, why, why would they end up building a parking lot there? Um, well, the, the Huron were never asked about that. Uh, and if it wasn't for uh, the courts, you would have to wonder whether the municipalities would ever have extended the scope of their consultation to include Aboriginal communities in their midst and whose lands their decisions affect. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, what's, what's really What's really uh, interesting and at the same time distressing about uh, the Idle No More protests and how quote unquote mainstream society has uh, responded to it is that it's, to me, it's really fed into um, this breakdown in relationship between the settler society, the majority settler society to which I belong and uh, many people here belong in indigenous communities in this country. Um, the fact that you would need a court to say that it's a constitutional duty to ask people whether you can put a parking lot on top of their ancestors' bones, I think this is quite remarkable. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I don't think it should be that way. Um, and I think that is probably not what the treaty relationship is about. I think when indigenous communities signed treaties with the crown, it was about sharing of the land. And uh, it wasn't just a one-off deal. It was supposed to be an ongoing relationship. Uh, so the, the kind of uh, high-handedness that you see on the part of the federal government, I think, is quite uh, antithetical to the well-functioning of a good relationship. Uh, and I think there's, there's a lot of really interesting technical details about what these statutes do, but what uh, animates this desire of the federal government to, to act in this way, I think, uh, is the attitude with, with which they're approaching the situation is what is really driving um, in my mind, my own anger, and potentially the anger of, of a lot of people who are part of this movement. Um, so, I think uh, it's it's also very interesting to me that the rhetoric of the rule of law that uh, many uh, people who are quite uh, against the Idle No More protests have been invoking. Uh, I get myself into Twitter fights more often than I should, but uh, <laughs> so, there, there it is. Um, so it, this Sun News asked people to retweet a uh, tweet about, um, about the blockades and telling people to retweet a tweet about uh, getting the police to enforce the law. And this was very strikingly interesting to me. Uh, most settlers in BC are squatting illegally on land uh, that was never purchased from the indigenous communities. Um, so I, I thought it would be pretty, you know, it would be an interesting thought experiment to see what, what that would be like if the police there enforced that law strictly. Um, so it, it's, uh, I think we're, we're in a situation where there's, there's a lot of politics, and um, politics is about how different people in this country relate to each other. And uh, I think it's a big moment in how we resolve this relationship, um, whether Canadians want to continually have 
a colonial relationship with indigenous communities or whether they want to move forward and uh, proceed on a basis of respect and honor and equality. So, so I see it. Thank you very much, San Juan, for those remarks. And our final speaker is Professor Bogal. She is an assistant professor here at Osgood whose research interests are in the areas of indigenous law, comparative and constitutional law, pluralism, and post-colonial legal theory. She is currently completing her doctorate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria. Her doctoral research on Stolo constitutionalism and the Coast Salish legal tradition has been supported by scholarships from both the Trudeau Foundation and SHRP. Her master's thesis critically examined the development of the duty to consult First Nations in Canadian law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bissell. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, in this conversation. Is this working? A little, a little louder. Sorry. Okay, I will try. Um, yeah. So, following up on uh, both Professor McNeil and San Juan's uh, presentations. Um, I will also speak to the issue of uh, consultation and negotiation. As you know, those issues uh, have sparked the I Don't Know More movement, and uh, they're, they're all related to the question of respect for the nation-to-nation -nation, uh, relationship that grounds the Canadian order, uh, if that order is to be grounded on respect and justice rather than dispossession and broken promises. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, upholding existing treaty relationships in good faith, acknowledging the power imbalance that exists today between First Peoples and the state, and willfully uh, contributing to the re-empowerment of First Nations through the negotiation and implementation of modern treaties uh, in a spirit of, of true and, and real collaboration. And we're also talking uh, obviously about respect for a consultation process affected in the same spirit. Um, so Professor McNeil uh, talked about a, a little bit about the scope and content of the duty to consult and uh, who and at what time were um, as non-native institutions and authorities uh, and governments supposed to fulfill that duty. I wanted to take things from uh, another angle and ask uh, who actually is to be consulted, uh, which raises the question of uh, political identity, authority, and accountability within uh, indigenous communities themselves. What uh, the Canadian legal order, in a sense, would like to, to nail down and to, uh, so to speak, to get a clear and definitive answer of sorts uh, on is what are the contours of uh, discrete indigenous political entities and who speaks in their name. Uh, this issue has uh, surfaced over the past few weeks as we saw headlines and heard commentary in the media em emphasizing disagreement, division, or lack of unity within indigenous ranks. We've heard uh, indigenous citizens within Idol No More who don't uh, feel necessarily adequately represented by their chiefs and council, or who criticize the approach taken by the uh, Assembly of First Nations toward their collective empowerment. There's also been, been much emphasis on the uh, lack of consensus among the chiefs regarding the mandate of their diplomatic uh, AFN representative, Sean Atlio. On the one end of the Canadian political spectrum, this diversity of views um, and the seeming absence of clear lines of vertical or hierarchical authority among indigenous voices and peoples has been used to dismiss and discredit the message that those voices convey. 
Instead of engaging with the complexity of indigenous political authority, this complexity is uh, offered by this end of the political spectrum as proof of the convenient old colonial assumption that indigenous peoples might not be able to govern themselves. But on the other end of the spectrum, too, there's a form, as I've heard it, a form of bafflement um, in the face of indigenous disagreement and differences uh, and diversity that results oftentimes in a negative connotation of it, of that disagreement and diversity. Um, among those who advocate that we listen to and respond to the call for decolonization, there seems to be a sort of fantasy of indigenous unity, consensus, and stability as fixed things, if you will, things that we should be able to rely on at the outset as we uh, go on to proceed with consultation and negotiation. As I see it, this fantasy, which uh, I have to say is also shared by some people within indigenous circles uh, who hold a somewhat romantic view of uh, their own society's past uh, and present, uh, prevents all of us, native and non-native, from grappling with the complex reality of our relationships. At the heart of this complex picture are the historical customary indigenous orders, which for, I think, many First Nations, if not all, express themselves through adaptable modes of governance where authority is actually spread across the nation between different families and granted to individuals within those families depending on their capacities and gifts as well as depending very much on the circumstances. Despite the destabilization of those uh, customary legal orders through uh, two and more centuries of colonial assimilation policies, those deeply decentralized non-state legal and political orders still function today within indigenous communities. Those orders often do not provide ready-made predetermined or fixed answers to the question of legal authority because it's, it's shared and in, it rests on processes that are designed to facilitate compromise on a case-by-case -case basis. And as such, always rests also on the willingness of the specific people involved uh, in conflict or uh, various uh, problematic situations internally to actually achieve compromise. More fundamentally, I think that history very often does not provide uh, ready-made or fixed answers to the question of the contours of indigenous political communities themselves, let alone who uh, would once and for all speak for them. Among people sharing uh, the same culture and language, there, um, there would be historically temporary associations and dissociations depending on the cause, movements and migrations to resolve uh, disputes or fulfill newly arising needs, and also assimilation of uh, people originally considered foreigners to any given group uh, within the indigenous world. And this is still all the case today. Um, yeah, we can talk about a lot of examples of temporary associations and dissociations that are the dynamic movement of a, of a living uh, polity. Alongside uh, this, uh, this reality of customary orders and uh, historical uh, affiliations grounded in a, a long history, there's also the more recent layer of governance that's put in place by the Indian Act, which is also now a part of the reality and has been appropriated and uh, has a legitimacy within um, native polities uh, and involves, as you know, the very difficult balancing, if, if not perilous balancing act of um, having to be on the part of ban chiefs and councils accountable at once to the, the Department of Indian Affairs and to their, their own um, electorate and constituency. Um, 
so this is all part of the complex picture that we all have to grapple with, with, with which is our present uh, today in Canada. And I think that um, insidiously the failure to grapple with that is also connected to, um, to the, the, the current uh, kind of mindset and attitude in uh, consultation and negotiations that non-native governments uh, have adopted, which is one that ignores or uh, refuses that complexity and seeks instead to um, consciously and unconsciously to reproduce uh, the, the colonial reality of a, of a dominant subject uh, relationship by, um, by within the context of negotiations, uh, putting some questions completely out of the frame of discussion and dialogue and pushing voices that would have those alternative uh, views, categories, conceptions of relationships to, uh, between people and between people and the land have all of, of those be discussed, be on the table, um, the, the way in which uh, the governments uh, approach negotia negotiations uh, of modern treaties has been, as uh, noted by observers and participants <coughs> and uh, critics of those negotiations, been one that is mainly a, a modern form of uh, reproduction of the, of the colonial relationship in, in a new, not necessarily much more subtle form, um, but still uh, very assimilative. And that's not to say that the, the communities that choose to engage in, in those are not cognizant of that. They, they are very cognizant of that. They choose to act um, through those mechanisms to provide their people with uh, tools, further tools that can be uh, used in a range of unexpected, potentially unexpected ways to affect change within, uh, within their communities. Um, but I, I think that uh, basically um, if we are to uh, really enter into negotiation and consultation with the objective of, and the real honest uh, goal towards decolonization, uh, it's going to entail embracing, uh, embracing and, and making room for uh, disagreement, the, the, the fact of disagreement within indigenous uh, communities and with um, the complexity of their own legal orders that is meant to uh, address that disagreement and uh, forge a way forward uh, that is meaningful and legitimate within, uh, within those communities. So um, I'll leave you with that. To, to, my, to my mind, the question of uh, who to consult and what's the contours of um, the people we are consulting um, is tied very much with um, and in, indissociably with the question of how we consult and so the question uh, directed towards uh, Aboriginal people and um, asking them to, um, to come forth in consensus, in unity, uh, has to be turned back towards uh, the, um, the settler partner in the conversation if it is to be an honest conversation.
No, it's an excellent question. Uh, I'll just repeat it because uh, I was told we should repeat the questions because they don't get picked up by the by the mic or the, the recorder here. Uh, the, you know, just very briefly, the question was, you know, what's the role of the law when negotiations fail, when the political process breaks down? And I, I sh you know, probably should have said at the beginning of, of my talk that I was really talking about Canadian law. Uh, but I think when, you know, hearing Sen Wang and Andre talk about uh, their different positions and, and perspectives, you know, I think there are very serious issues here around legitimacy. And, you know, I'd say le legitimacy is different from legality. So we can look at the Canadian legal system and say, well, and that's what I was doing, and say, well, it provides for this duty to consult, and it, that's a constitutional duty, and what are the parameters of it? And those are all defined by, by Canadian law. So one can say that's the role of Canadian law, to make sure that governments live up to their constitutional obligations, you know, that they respect Aboriginal rights and treaty rights, and that part of that is this duty to engage in consultation, and, you know, for a circumstance where that arises and so on. But, you know, Sen Wang mentioned the rule of law, and, you know, I, I think approaching this from the strictly Canadian legal system uh, approach is, is problematic, you know, because I really think there's a lack of legitimacy, which, you know, goes to Andre's point about, you know, colonialism that we really haven't dealt with. You know, we're still imposing laws. Uh, the Indian Act and, you know, these new acts of parliament are going to be imposed on Indigenous peoples uh, and, you know, without adequate consultation. But even if there is consultation, it's fairly limited. And, you know, Supreme Court's been the high the decision. It's not a veto, you know. Governments can go ahead. They just have to talk with people in appropriate circumstances, accommodate and so on. So it's an engagement at a certain level, but it, it's not the nation-to-nation -nation relationship that I think Aboriginal peoples in Canada thought they were entering into when they entered into treaties and so on. So yeah, there are legal avenues within Canadian law, but I think they're fairly limited, and there are big issues of legitimacy uh, around that approach. Mm -hmm around the approach that I described, right, in, in my, my talk. Mm -hmm. Andre or Sam, do you want to add to that? Go ahead. I'm good. I think, uh, I, thank you. Um, I think, Professor Minnelli, your point about uh, legitimacy is, uh, is absolutely correct. Um, but I think even for the Canadian legal system, it's seen as legitimate from within the settler community. And the way the settler community conducts itself I think is um, there, there might be more room for the Canadian legal system to uh, constrain that behavior. Um, I think you know one example would be the duty to consult, which ten years ago didn't really exist. Um, so I think that that's that's moving people forward. I think that's uh, that's uh, at least getting you know, governments of all sorts, municipalities, to actually find out who are the First Nations, mm -hmm. who are the Aboriginal communities that live next door. Yeah. Um, I think you know, there's this dynamic relationship between uh, the legal system and, and society, and uh, the le legal system has ways of pushing people to uh, get out of their comfort zones and you know, to enter into new kinds of relationships. You know, there's, there's a potential for that and a robust interpretation by the courts of that duty has the potential to uh, bring us further along in the process of um, engaging in a relationship with respect. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, there's, it, it, kind of, it, it kind of begins from there. And, uh, there's you know, ways that uh, litigation gets conducted has a lot of implications for, for that relationship. Um, so you, you've probably heard about that, the new uh, non-status Métis case. Uh, 
um, which uh, apparently the, the, the Crown uh, spent a lot of time uh, fighting with the applicants about uh, whether the documents that they had gotten from the National Archives were authentic or not. Mm. Uh, it's one of these things where you're like, well, it's in the archives. You put it in the archives yourself. So what's the fight about? But, you know, they, they decided to have this fight. So um, you know, why, why do they choose to behave in this way? Um, is there something that the settler legal system can do about the way that uh, mm. they're behaving? I think these are you know, potential uh, avenues mm. to consider. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe the, the only thing uh, I would add to that uh, is that I, in the, in the little experience I have witnessing um, negotiations on the West Coast um, within the Coast Salish world, I was struck by the, the way in which Oftentimes, governments, negotiators are um, are coming from far away <laughs> and don't know who they're talking to. They just don't know the people. And there's people around the table who um, are there kind of allowed to be present but not to speak, who are at the much more um, local levels of governments who are married into the communities, who have relatives who are part of, who, who know a lot more the landscape, the, the, the resources that are being discussed, um, and, and who have contributions to make towards uh, very creative uh, problem solving, a resolution of actual um, discussions on the table, but are not formally interlocutors in the negotiation um, as it happens between the federal, the provincial, and the First Nations. And it always struck me that this was one of the, uh, in the same um, line of, of, uh, of reasoning, as, uh, as you just exposed, there's ways in which our current system could legally be much improved if we tried to have a conversation that's uh, more on the long term with people who have gotten to know each other over time. Um, we tend to think of the country as this kind of huge expanse of territory and um, govern kind of uniformly across. And it's just very different from place to place. And I think we need to um, em embrace more the, the notion of uh, globalism that you might be uh, f um, familiar with, kind of having an eye at the same time to um, broad uh, uh, national and international affiliations and collaborations, but at the same time making space for very local experimentation and long-term conversations between people who are rooted in a place. Uh, I think we have a question next. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, just from a practical pers perspective, um, yeah, there's, there's a bill now that itself wasn't respected. Uh, C45 has all sorts of constitutionally questionable uh, matters, I guess. There's a majority government that doesn't seem to care about that. Do you think it's kind of like a, an issue by issue thing that's going to be raised and this movement is gathering awareness and that's all, that's, that's what we're um, But how, what, what, do you, what do you guys predict will, will happen either out of this movement or just to build C45 or just a, a practical, a practical uh, maybe not even such a legal answer. Legal can be used a lot, I'm sure, <laughs> to, to what's going to happen, but just, just, uh, just how do you foresee this uh, situation?
to challenge uh, C38 and C45. So that's uh, that's a thing to, to pay attention to. Very interesting. This angle. Um, I I don't I don't know about this this whole thing. I, I guess uh, you know there there's the law, but there's also politics, and there's uh, there's the way that settler communities politics is sorting itself out on how it sees these issues and what kind of relationship it wants. And I think, you know, in a democracy, uh, as, as the majority community, uh, the settler community has really got the ball in its court about what it wants to do as it wants another few decades of you know, colonial relations uh, with such a Aboriginal communities, or does it not apply something else? Um, I think I think it's uh, that's that's something that's going to be resolved in you know living rooms across the country in the next little while. How how people talk about it um, and uh, how how they decide that if they want to vote about it, how concerned they are getting in touch with their elected representatives about these kinds of things. Um, do they care? Do they care that you know there's going to be a ton of debris going into some river that's going to mean a First Nation has no fish? No. Well, yeah, so you know, if, if the answer is going to be no, then this is the relationship that we're choosing, right? Yeah. I'd I just add to that that you know, I think what the I Don't Know More movement, you know, one of the things that has done is brought a lot of these issues to public attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that in Canada, uh, there's a, a serious lack of public education mm -hmm. around issues mm -hmm. uh, involving Aboriginal peoples. And, you know, I, I grew up in the prairies, I'm from Saskatchewan. You know, Saskatchewan's, you know, covered by treaties that were entered into the, in the 1870s when we, and uh, I learned nothing about those treaties in school. Of course, this was in the you know, 1950s, 1960s, but even in university, in my history classes, you know, we didn't learn about this. So I think public education is, is so important. And yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I hope you're wrong that you know, Canadians don't care about whether the fish are poisoned and that only affects a First Nation community. I, I hope that we're, you know, that we're more generous and that we've got you know, broader concerns about our our community, you know, as Canada, our local communities, and our First Nation communities, whether we're a part of them or not. Right? So, so I, <laughs> I hope that I, that cynical position is wrong politically. I think, you know, I think most people want to be fair if if they have enough information and they understand. So I, I think that's that's really important. Yeah, sure. Um, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic than uh, than you, in part because I feel that um, I, it's the first time that I, um, in in the recent history since say um, the Oka crisis, which was for me one of the moments of becoming aware at age something like 13 or 14 of what was going on and uh, it's, it's the first time since then that I feel that the issues carried by the indigenous movements are, are actually very, um, are, get, are, are getting a lot of people on board who are not, who are not indigenous. Um, and you know I think that there's part of it in the in the um, case of Idle No More that comes from, um, you know, following in the wake of movements like Occupy. Um, and uh, in, in Quebec, definitely, that's part of where my optimism, well, um, moderate optimism comes from, is that um, there's been a lot of discussion, even in the media that, uh, that I follow, um, of the kinds of new conversations that have been taking place at the site of protests between people uh, who are coming out of the student movement of last spring, um, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, the, the, the very um, small but still important um, uh, gains that the 
left of the left in Quebec is making in, in, uh, in local politics. So there's, I think, productive uh, conversations happening. And I was listening to Sean Avio last week um, uh, in an interview where you know, he was saying there's, there's a long view to this. You know, everything we do is based on the idea that uh, if we're having a certain kind of conversation, you and I, he was saying, saying to the um, CBC journalist, um, we are very much working towards our, our children having a different kind of conversation. And I feel there's a, a great wisdom and truth in that. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, what, is to, what is to replace it and what has started in little uh, incremental ways to replace it um, in different communities is uh, a form of um, articulation of the customary orders that I've been talking about that, are, that, are, that haven't disappeared. Um, even though there's been a lot of upheaval uh, through the, the colonial assimilation policies, I think that um, what, what is to, um, the, the, the constitutional grounding for the recognition of those orders can be found in section 35. The, the rights uh, and title of Aboriginal people includes the continuation of their governance structures um, and of, of uh, and, and incorporates to a degree the, um, uh, the, the legal foundations that are present within the various communities in their great diversity across the country. Uh, obviously, the, the question, and, and one of the questions that comes from this is how are we going to uh, meet the challenge of becoming competent in uh, in discussing all of those uh, various orders, laws, categories, concepts, principles, um, processes of conflict re resolution, I think that's that's the very long view, um, and that um, yeah, but that that there is definitely a grounding in in my to my mind in uh, in the constitution already for for those orders being recognized. Yeah, I, I agree with Andre on that, that Section 35 provides the constitutional space and that uh, Aboriginal peoples in Canada can make use of that constitutional space. You know, of course it can be done through agreement, but I would argue that agreement isn't even necessary, that a right of self-government is, is an Aboriginal right constitutionally protected. Yeah. And it should take precedence over the Indian Act, for example. You know, I think the ban council system in the Indian Act, you know, was usually imposed on First Nations without their consent and violated their Aboriginal rights, including their Aboriginal rights to self-government. So if they reassert that right, I think that they themselves could decide the Indian Act doesn't apply to us and they can, you know, reestablish their own institutions or, you know, as Andrea said, often those institutions are still there and still functioning. But the Indian Act is what is officially recognized, the Bank Council of Government. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's you know, lots of room within the Canadian Constitution here for uh, assertion, really, assertion mm -hmm. of a, a right of self-government. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for, for me, a little bit of um, 
History is also very interesting. Uh, what we know of as the Indian Act with you know, Indian status and the register of Indians, it really just dates to 1951. Um, before that, uh, the definition of an Indian in the Indian Act was a person reputed to be an Indian. Because the government just had no idea. They couldn't, like, they didn't know enough about the facts on the ground to be able to say who belongs to which community. They just relied on the customary facts on the ground of, you know, across the country. So the, the kind of colonial control that they're asserting is actually, in some ways, like quite weak, right? Like there, there's these uh, parallel councils in lots of communities that uh, I'm sure that your research has done as well. Louder? Okay. There's, I, there's parallel councils in a lot of communities that uh, where traditional governance is still taking place. Mm -hmm.
I mean, I agree with you about you know the Canadian legal system and you know the way it's still imposed on uh, First Nations and, and uh, Indigenous peoples generally in Canada. I mean, that it, that's the way it has been, and that's the way it's still happening. So the court decisions, I think, they can be helpful, and you know there have been quite a few positive decisions from the Supreme Court, like the Hyder decision that involved the duty to consult. You know, and the Sparrow decision about uh, you know, recognition of Aboriginal rights in the Constitution, fishing rights, and so on. Uh, but I think one needs to be aware that the courts will only go so far. They're, the courts are part of the nation state. They're part of the government in a way. They're one of the three branches, and they're not going to sort of. The, the Supreme Court said this: we're not going to undermine you know, Canada's constitutional system. So, you know, getting back to the rule of law, when we're talking about the rule of law in Canada, we're basically talking about Canadian law as made by non-Aboriginal Canadians. So, you know, French law and, and, and English law that was brought here and then the laws that are made by, by Parliament and the legislatures and the judges, we're not really talking about Indigenous law. So to, to to talk about the rule of law in that way is already sort of prejudicing the issue. And, you know, many scholars, uh, indigenous scholars in particular, people like John Burroughs and Val Napoleon and so on, have been saying to us, Canadian legal system has to include indigenous law. And it has to be part of the converse, conversation and it has to be brought in so that we're not just relying on the legal institutions of the Canadian state. And I think that's right. And, and that to sort of get out of colonialism, we have to move in that direction. But it, it's not going to happen overnight, right? And the, the Canadian courts are, as I said, they're maybe not the right place to do this. Their, their role is fairly limited and their power and what they are willing to do, I think, is fairly limited. So we see them, they'll make a positive decision in one case, like the Del Gamook decision, 1997, then you see them pull back in the Marshall and Bernard case about, uh, you know, 10 years later or less. So, yeah, yep, and, and this is sort of a, a peeve of mine, but, you know, the, and, and it goes to the issue that Senlon was talking about, about the positions governments will take in courts. And what you often find is the Canadian government and the provincial governments lining up against indigenous peoples in these cases. And they're using our tax money you know, to fight against the rights that indigenous people should have and shouldn't have to fight over and over again in court to have recognized. So you know, I think this is a big problem. So the, the judicial system is, yeah, it, it's, it can be used in positive ways, but that's its limitations. That's my real problem. Okay. Um, I have a question about the Indigenous Peoples Act. Um, so in Indigenous Peoples Act, it talks about
The question was about the, the Daniels case uh, and the decision to uh, decision about the meaning of Section 9124 and the 1867 Constitution. Uh, 9124 says uh, Indians and lands reserved for Indians uh, is an exclusive legislative jurisdiction of the federal government. Um, so I'm going to take this chance to do a plug for uh, the firm blog, uh, www.okplaw.com. Uh, click on blog. Uh, we've been doing uh, these little write-ups uh, of big cases and big issues as they come up, and uh, we did one on the Daniels case last week. Um, so I encourage you uh, to take a look, and I encourage everyone to go take a look. I think there's lots of interesting stuff there. Um, I, I think, I, I hope that it, uh, is, it is good ammunition for people who are curious uh, to dispel some of the misinformation and disinformation that, that is being spread around um, the mainstream media. Um, my reading of Daniels, um, and I'm, I, I think it's not, uh, the, 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 leaf, the, the meaning of it is, is I, I'm not really quite sure where it's going to go. All it says is that Section 9124, Indians and Indians are for Indians, includes more than just uh, the Indian Act definition of an Indian. Uh, sorry for using these words. This is just statutory language. Uh, apologize for that. Um, so basically, it seems like uh, the Crown spent 12 years uh, fighting to say that it could define the scope of its constitutional power through an ordinary statute. It was trying to say that the statutory definition of an Indian in the Indian Act exhausted the definition of Indian in the Section 9124. The court has denied this. This is my understanding of the decision. Um, I don't think it means that uh, non-status people and Métis people are, become status Indian. Um, it just means that there's potentially a federal power to legislate over them. Um, and if it doesn't, then I don't know, you know what, what, what they'll do about that. Or how, how much you want the federal government to be legislating over them anyway. Maybe I could just uh, address it a little bit. I mean, as Zenon was saying, you know, I, I think all the decision does is say that Métis and non-status are within 
Section 9124, and therefore under federal jurisdiction. But it, it doesn't make these people in these things. It doesn't change anyone's status or identity. It's just about legislative jurisdiction, really. Um, and it doesn't make the Indian Act apply either. Um, there was a, a similar decision from the Supreme Court back in 1939 that said the Inuit are also Indians under Section 9124. But they're not under the Indian Act. They're not part of it. They're, you know, separate indigenous people or peoples within Canada. Uh, so it, 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 I mean, the media, I think, has sort of misled us <laughs> on this issue about the impact of the decision. And, you know, I'm not sure it's going to have an impact on, on hunting rights. It may have an impact on the application of provincial laws to Métis and non-status people. That's, it may have that kind of an impact. Uh, but that still, I think, has to be worked out. But certainly, it, it doesn't change anyone's identity or doesn't change the application of the Indian Act. Um, so, yeah, it's not as, as significant as it may appear to some people. Maybe just to, to end on, on a, on a different, slightly different note, I just want to say that there's a whole set of really interesting questions with respect to rights, entitlements, and identity that would be asked if we took the standpoint of looking at what's, what, the, what are the relationships between people on the ground and what are their expectations uh, of each other since um, they've lived together for a long time. So you can ask, as you do, what are the impacts of a legal decision on uh, the, the community you're talking about, but you can also um, take a different angle and try to, and, and this is what uh, the customary uh, research, legal research is, is about, is trying to understand what are the competing set of principles that are also applying in parallel to the preoccupations about the categories and boundaries drawn by the Indian Act and dropped when the Indian Act ceases to apply. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes today's talk.